The information contained in this podcast is an expression of opinion and does not constitute investment advice. This is the Gold Money Foundation podcast with Dominic Frisbee, keeping you up to date with expert opinion on precious metals and the markets. Hello and welcome to the Gold Money Foundation podcast hosted in association with Frisbee's Bulls and Bears. I'm Dominic Frisbee and in today's program I'm talking to Dr. John Wustencroft, aka the junior mining cynic. You may remember a few months ago I had him on the show and uh, John did a very interesting presentation how on how a junior mining company can go from a PE of 1 to a PE of 100 in 18 easy steps. And uh, uh, but today, John's uh, coming back on the show with a rather more positive message about gold mining companies, though in this case, we're going to be talking about the senior gold mining comp- uh, companies. And John has 18 thoughts on the seniors. So, John, uh, welcome to the show. Let's crack on with thought number one, which is that we're lucky. Yes, Dominic, I think we're incredibly lucky because uh, for the first time in our investing lives unless you were investing as a schoolboy and that wouldn't surprise me the uh <laughs> the, the the seniors the the by by a senior we mean the big producers with a couple of mines maybe producing a couple of hundred ounces a year plus a lot of them you know around a million some more than that not the sort of mom and pop operations with a single mine somewhere that's basically just a one-off or, or I, I classify all these as the junior uh, space, all the non-producers where some guy's got some option over some land and doing some drilling or they've got a resource. The real genuine senior gold mining businesses, they're on good valuations and we can get exposure to the gold price and in many cases get a dividend as well just by buying these what are to some people relatively boring companies. So I think we're lucky because we haven't been able to do this uh, well, I haven't been able to do this probably since I was about 11, and I didn't know anything about investing when I was 11, uh, and possibly you too, Dominic. So I think we're blessed. I'm not sure I know anything about it now, but there we go. <laughs> well, I didn't want to say. Um, I'm, I'm, I think we're blessed. We'd be more blessed, of course, if, if we hadn't held so many, so many juniors in the past whose, whose price has been decimated in the past year or so. But if you've been in this market a while, you've, you've had some ups, you've had some downs. Uh, most of us who've been in a while are certainly well up. And uh, my, my sort of thought today is maybe we should be thinking about these genuine senior gold mining businesses because we're in the very, very fortunate position um, that, that, that we, we can buy them as on a reasonable valuation, as reasonable businesses. And I think it's fair to say that most people are thinking with the gold mining sector today, is, should, should I get in now or is it going to go any lower? And that's a much better position to be buying in than should I sell now or is it a mugs game and is it going to go higher? It's, it's good to be in a distressed market and to be a buyer in a distressed market. And I, I think that's a good position to be in. Um, okay. So, so, so we're lucky people. We should be grateful. Okay. Well, well that brings us on to um, point number two, which you call optionality. Um, but I, I suppose I want to ask you, and this will lead you into to point number two, is is I mean, the, the gold mining companies aren't necessarily the cheapest that they've ever been. I think they were cheaper maybe in 2000. But um, on a relative basis, I think that's your point. You can value them as proper companies. Yes. I, in, in the past, analysts, I believe this is true in 2000, have had to think of all sorts of amazing wheezes to value gold mining companies because historically the price earning ratios were, were particularly high in their 30s and 40s. Silver companies... I remember a silver CEO telling me years ago that they had PEs in the 50s and therefore there was massive upside for their company. Um, <laughs> now, 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 a cynic would, would sort of say an analyst basically has to think of something with which to compare companies. And just as in the dot-com boom, where there weren't any earnings to speak of, and so analysts had to talk about clicks and about um, number of subscribers or whatever. And we've seen a little little bit of this uh, again with Facebook recently. They came up with, with, with what I think is remarkable, I won't say a con, but it's a bit of a wheeze to say, uh, well, these miners aren't producing any money, but they've got lots of gold in the ground. And let's, um, let's look at gold futures going forwards, gold options. You know, p- people can trade the futures market and buy options to buy gold at higher and higher prices in the, in the, in the future. And basically, they're 
paying some money in order to get some sort of return in the future if the gold price rises. And instead of going onto the options market, you can buy a gold miner because if the gold price goes up, then you'll, you'll get a return with the increase in share price. And crazy ideas like this really were how people used to value uh, gold mining companies in the past because they couldn't value them on profits. Now, I think the important thing to say today, and it's, it's not just true of gold miners, it's particularly true of gold miners, but the option value across the whole market has gone. No one's valuing Apple, for example, uh, on option value. It's on a P of about 11 or 12 or something. It's an amazing company. It's done amazing things. But everyone thinks it's going to hit a brick wall, and therefore they're not expecting more amazing things to come. It's got a relatively reasonable valuation on an earnings basis. Um, and this is very true of the gold miners. No one anymore is thinking about gold in the ground and what these ounces might be worth in the future. People are looking at ordinary, boring things like cash flow and profits and dividends. So all this optionality, all this promise about jam tomorrow, the way of valuing a company on the basis of jam tomorrow, all that's gone. And that really leads us into um, thinking further about how can we value gold stocks today and which gold sh stocks should we be looking at? Because the way people have looked at stocks over the past 10 years, those sorts of valuation metrics are history. And unfortunately, that's why lots of the juniors, you know, in my opinion, are pretty worthless because juniors are basically option value on some jam tomorrow story. OK, well, we can treat and value stocks as normal companies. That's point number three. So um, how do you value, value gold stocks? Well, you open the page of the FT, uh, you look at the, 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 the companies in there, and they've got price earnings ratios and dividend yields. Uh, as I said just recently, you, you, know, you, you didn't used to be able to do this with gold companies, but you can now. Uh, it's the starting point for any stock. You can look at the, the enterprise value, which is the, the debt plus the market capitalization, and its cash flow, or you look at its price earnings. It's not rocket science. You can pick up any book on investing. Um, what is rocket science is when you go along to a presentation and you get some brightly colored graphs with drill holes and grades and um, all sorts of nonsense that is hopefully going to convince you to buy into a junior mining story. That's all, all jam tomorrow. Uh, valuing a company on its cash flow, its, its sustainable cash flow um, and its dividend yield is pretty boring, I have to agree. But you can do that now with gold miners and you can sit there and get a 2 or 3% dividend every year from some of them. Very good. Um, do we still need to value juniors in terms of the gold in the ground? Well, perhaps. Well, you have to, in a way, because there's no other way to value them because they don't actually generate any cash. Uh, if you're a farmer and you have a field and it's lying fallow and it's not doing anything, someone will still come along and, and buy that field. They're taking a bit of a risk because they don't know they'll be able to make any profit out of it. Uh, but if the farmer made up some fancy story about how you can get so much yield per acre growing corn or wheat on this field, especially if it sort of stretched the imagination a bit, you'd tend not to believe him. You'd probably think of a going rate for, for farming land. It's probably a bit high at the moment in farming at the moment. And uh, maybe you have to think this way about some of the juniors. Um, but I think the whole market's pretty cynical. This, this morning, Highland Gold came out with a news release where they bought some gold assets for $134 an indicated ounce. And the share price has fallen and people are saying this is a crazy, you know, who's, who's buying gold at $134? There's so many distressed asset, assets around. So yes, you can think of uh, valuing juniors perhaps as gold in the ground, indicated, proven or probable to have a feasibility study. But it's beginning to mean less and less and the value that people, um, people attach to that is really getting less and less as, as well. Um, okay. So, so you've got to value these juniors on some metric because they don't have any cash flow. So, but it's a bit like valuing a dot-com company. Okay, let's talk about um, uh, thought number four, the balance sheet. Yes, I, I think when you first come to the, the mining sector, you can get suckered in and have all these nice uh, drill hole results and fancy stories and massive net present values. And you get carried away with these with, with re, these remarkable stories, but they are stories, and you, I think we need to realise just how many how many juniors have very very weak balance sheets. I mean, they don't really have balance sheets; they don't have any cash. Uh, they don't have cash in the bank. They don't have cash flow. They've got high debt. Um, they can't pay dividends. What every, everybody should really be looking for in a normal stock, going back hundreds of years, and, unless you're at the very very speculative end, and this. 
the fact that the balance sheets are very weak rules out most juniors. And, um, and most mines, one, one thing to remember about a balance sheet is mines, building mines simply doesn't make sense if you dilute the company and issue shares. Like many infrastructure, big, big capex projects, it only makes sense if you can do something through debt. And majors can raise debt because they have asset backing. They've got tangible assets on the balance sheet and they've got genuine recurring cash flows. Juniors can't do that, so they end up hedging, they end up getting ripped off by the bank, they don't deliver, they have to buy gold in the market to deliver into their hedge and it all goes wrong. So a strong balance sheet, to me, is not just about sort of the debt or, you know, cash in the bank. It's about what sort of assets they have and what they can do with those assets to make them a, a viable company. And let's face it, you know, the first question we ask a junior is when you're going to run out of money, when you're going to have to come with your tail between, between your legs back to the market. And that's, that's, that's just not there with the seniors. They've got genuine strong balance sheets and they can leverage those uh, to, to, to make more money for the shareholders. Thought number five, margin. Yes, well, of course, investors always look ahead and, and, and gold stocks have been, have been trashed recently because everybody's scared of rising costs. I think costs are rising somewhere between 10 and 20 percent a year. The gold price isn't uh, and therefore everyone um, somehow thinks all the gold miners are going to be out of business um, in a year or two. Uh, I think this is a typical um, view that lots of people have when they only look at one side of the equation. They say costs are rising the gold price isn't, therefore all these companies you know, are going to go bust or cease making profits. But the market's dynamic and things change. In fact, the oil price has fallen recently and, and, and raw materials prices are falling. Some of the majors have said they're going to defer uh, capex uh, uh, build-outs on big projects. So costs are probably going to stop falling and maybe gold's just having a pause. But if you are concerned about margin, like, like any business, um, especially in a distressed market, you, you, you buy margin. You buy a company that's got low cash costs, low total cost of production. The market's trashed everybody in the last year or so. Uh, so now's the time perhaps to go out and look for those very high quality companies. Websites like kitco.com has a nice list every week or two of seniors and juniors. You can go and look at them, investigate and see which ones you think are going to survive this and, and, and will have a margin come what may. Um, of course, this doesn't apply to juniors because they don't have a margin because they don't actually sell anything. But it does apply to seniors. And I think there's an argument to, to look at some seniors that are resilient um, and, and not worry too much about margin because the resilient seniors will survive whatever. It's only the maybe the South African producers or the Australian producers with very, very high cash costs that may go under if we see a real crash in the gold price. Growth. Well, Again, investors look ahead. We're, we're worried about rising costs. Of course, we don't just want a boring dividend. We're not buying a utility company when we invest in a gold miner. We want the industry phase, I suppose, is growth at a reasonable price. Maybe the current price earnings ratio is a bit high, but in a year, two year, three years, more assets are coming on stream and the production is, is going to rise. And again, you can look at, I mean, even Barrick and Newmont have, have, have growth profiles. Uh, stronger than I would say than some of the oil majors who are finding it very hard to grow at all. But lots of the, the intermediate seniors, we're still talking about big companies here, billion plus market caps, uh, two billion, three billion market caps. They've got some quite good growth stories. Uh, and um, again, when you look at the juniors, they're not GARP, growth at a reasonable price, they're, they're GALP, growth at an unreasonable price, or in fact, NGALP, which would be no growth at an unreasonable price because they're never going to get into production. So, again, we, we can buy our boring senior miner or we can pay a bit more, go for a miner that's got some good margin in there, go for a miner with a good growth story. Um, and all the time you're going to be investing in a company that has a very, very low chance of, of going bust and returning absolutely nothing to, to the shareholders. Very good. Now, uh, one of the things um, as we come on to point number seven that I was struck by when I saw some of the presentations at PDAC earlier uh, in the year was uh, Brent Cook and Mickey Fulk, both geologists, uh, newsletter writers, both said that one of the problems if a company, a tiny little exploration company, finds some huge deposit, one of the problems it faces is uh, it's never got a hope in hell of putting it into production. So uh, barriers to entry. That, that's absolutely right. Now, when you're talking about a normal business, barrier, a barrier to entry sort of means different things because there's marketing and branding and things like that. So it means a little bit different here. 
But you're absolutely right. Juniors don't have this strong balance sheet. A junior can't go along to a government and say, here we are, we'd like to borrow 500 million and build this mine. And the government will probably be laughing at them, saying, well, you're probably going to overrun, you'll go bust. What about the environmental bond? There'll be all sorts of reasons that's going to shut smaller companies out from, um, fr fr from building mines. Costs are rising, access to capital is falling, the ability to raise debt is, is, is falling. Now, and, and another point to make about the barrier to entry is the really, really good mines. They're very high capex, very high impact mines in terms of infrastructure and environment. And they need a strong balance sheet and access to huge amounts of capital and debt. These mines just don't make much sense without debt, really, I think. But if you're in that position where you can have a high capex, very long life mine, I mean, that's what the majors absolutely love. And people call them, the, you know, boring because they try and they spend three billion building a mine that's going to last for 30 years. But when you built it, and when that's throwing off cash for 30 years, you know, in my opinion, those are the sorts of companies that you want to be in. You don't want to be in some of these Australian narrow vein miners who've only got a year or two of um, uh, uh, reserves left and they're forever exploring, uh, which is ramping up the sustaining uh, capex. And of course, smaller companies, uh, the government can play around with them. Uh, they're in a corner, they've got one asset, single asset, they find it hard to say no to anybody because if they don't develop that asset to do something with, with it, they can't carry on drawing, the CEO can't carry on drawing a nice salary. A major can always walk away and, and, and go to other assets. They can expand existing mines and that's much lower risk than building a new mine. So I, I think there are barriers to entry in the really juicy projects which, which do deserve a premium in terms of valuation. And it's the, it's, it's the seniors that are going to benefit here it's going to be very hard for smaller companies to actually build mines, uh, not just environmentally in terms of capital. Uh, mines are getting more and more uh, expensive to build, and they have to be bigger and bigger in order to uh, in order to be attractive to, 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 you know, for governments to, to, to go along with them. So I think barrier to entry is a good one, and seniors have it and juniors don't. Okay, and you touched on this here. A major, if, if, if say, he's having trouble with his mine in Mali, can just go, well, to hell with Mali, I'm going to go and concentrate on the mine in Brazil. Um, that uh, brings us to our next thing, diversity. Yep, m multiple revenue streams. You may have multiple mines. You may have multiple metals. Uh, I think there was a FTSE 100 company, I can't remember its name now, BATM maybe, in, in, in the dot-com boom. It basically made a single product and went bust. That was, it was all over. Um, so sing single product companies deserve a huge discount. Um, so single mine mining companies, uh, single country mining companies, there's lots of risk there. People are worried about resource nationalism. A mine can go wrong. I remember, was it a Gympie or Gympie Goldfields in Australia a few years ago? They just had a, it was a coal mine. They had a fire and they just issued a news release to say, we're very sorry, we've had a fire and we've shut down. And that was it. And the company just went bust overnight. Yeah. These things can happen in the mining business. I do um, know, it, in, in defense of, uh, it, it, just as a little story, I know one silver company, uh, and you've probably owned shares in it at one stage, deliberately said we, uh, they ignored all their lead and zinc byproducts and just mined the silver uh, so that they would become a pure silver play. Now, they had four or five different mines. Uh, well, they, have, they now have uh, three or four different mines, I should say, and various exploration properties. So they have diversified in that sense, but they wanted to be a pure silver play, which is yes. a risky strategy. But when, when everyone wants silver, I suppose it, it, it does pay you back. Well, there's a, I think there's a split there between what they're doing as a business, which is be a, being a polymetallic miner, and how they're branding themselves as a silver miner. Now, that probably worked two years ago when um, base metals miners were on PEs of seven and silver miners were on PEs of 20, but they're all on PEs of seven now. So may, maybe there's not much advantage to that anymore. Um, but yes, that, that company's got some diversity, and, and quite a few. Uh, there are quite a few companies like that. S Silver Corp. I don't think I don't know whether this is, this is the company you mean. It but, wasn't actually, but uh, I was actually but, talking about yeah. First Majestic. But anyway, okay. But yeah. Silver Corp. Yes, it's called Silver Corp. But they actually produce huge amounts of lead and zinc as well, and they did that to get the valuation and to allude to Gold Corp. So uh, one has to look beyond the marketing and look and see what the the actual business of the company company is and see how resilient they are in terms of diversity, right. yes. I mean, in First Majestic's case, I actually think Keith Nurmai, the president, deliberately just leaves the, the lead and zinc in the tailings. He doesn't want anything to do with it. 
Right, okay. Well, there's an opportunity there. If there's any CEO of a junior base metals miner listening, he'll be on to Keith and he'll be For his tailings. Reprocessing those tailings and he'll be raising money on the, on the TSXV next week. All right. Uh, replacement cost, number 10. Uh, sorry, uh, no, number nine, negotiating strength. Yeah, well, I think what, what we're sort of moving on, you know, the barrier to entry, the, the diversity, that you can overcome barriers to entry, rather. They've got diversity. I, I think this leads on to the fact that these, these big companies uh, basically have a sort of pricing power because they've got different opportunities around the world, because they've got different assets around the world. As you say, we, they don't like what's going on in Mali. They'll build in Peru. If resource nationalism is turning on them one place. They're now in a position, and they haven't been in this massive commodities boom that we've had recently. They're now in a position where they can walk away and say, OK, well, we'll just go somewhere else. And so this is a sort of another form of optionality, really. They have the option of deciding where to expand, where to build a new mine. Again, a, a junior doesn't have that. A senior does have that. Um, and I think this is, this is another, another good thing to think about when you're looking at if, if you're investing in a senior to see just how, how diverse they are, how they can overcome the barriers to entry because they've got a strong balance sheet. And basically, that means how strong they are in negotiating with governments and negotiating with suppliers and so on. Replacement cost, number 10. Yes, well, when, I mean, the goals popped a little bit in the day and Barrick's probably up a few percent, but Barrick was around a $30 billion company, I think, recently, somewhere around that figure. And they do about 7 million ounces an hour, uh, a year, I think. Now, to produce 7 million ounces a year, well, let, let's think of a little junior that's going to spend 200 million to build a mine to get 100,000 ounces of production. And they've already spent 100 million in endless fundraisings to get to a bankable feasibility study. So it's cost 300 million to get here. They haven't even built the mine yet, but it's, it will have cost 300 million by the time they've built uh, for 100,000 ounces. I think that's a pretty reasonable sort of ballpark figure for what it takes to get a small gold mine into operation now. Barrick is 70 times as big as that, so that's 21 billion it would take to actually build out Barrick's mines plus all that risk, plus all the discounting for time. You can actually buy a ready-made miner for roughly the same sort of price and not have to take the risk and actually start getting dividends today. Um, and some people estimate that because of increasing costs, the sort of capex intensity of new gold mines is actually $2,000 or more per gold produced. So in the coming years, you just won't be able to build mines unless gold is at $2,000 an ounce in general. At the sort of at the margin, it just won't make economic sense. So why not go out there and just buy somebody that's already done it? They've already sunk all those capex costs. These very big, uh, open pit, long life mines often have quite low sustaining capex. So they're they're the sort of genuine uh, companies that throw off cash. Um, and when you look at them on a replacement cost basis, you know, I, again, I think the seniors look pretty good value. You, you, you can buy into one. You don't have to take part in a private placing and help some junior builder mine. You can actually buy them at a discount right now. I, I like your next line. Uh, tell us about the replacement cost of a junior. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, well, you know, I think, yes, uh, okay, maybe I'm a cynic. I think the replacement cost of a junior is a nice suit, flashy watch, uh, £20,000 option of a bit of land in the Yukon. I reckon you could... Uh, and a listing on the a reversal into a, into a, uh, a shell on the on the Canadian Venture Exchange, and, and you've got your junior. Um, maybe you have to entertain a few newsletter writers as well to get get a write up somewhere. That that's the replacement cost. Yes, N not not quite in the same league as re replacement cost of Barrick or Newmont. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Boring is fun. Yes, I think uh, I think Dylan Grice made this comment uh, recently at the Money Week conference. Um, that you also spoke at is that people overvalue risk and they undervalue safety. Uh, Jam tomorrow is a very, very exciting uh, prospect. Um, but if we are concerned about um, the world in sort of monetary terms and we're interested in gold because we think it's a, a good quality financial asset and we're probably interested in gold miners for the same reason, why are we taking ridiculous risk uh, on these smaller junior companies? I've seen many, many posts on bulletin boards where people have bought into a miner that basically went bust and they gave their reason they want to sort of protect their future wealth. Well, you protect your future wealth with gold. But if you're buying into a gold miner, there's still of that sort of wealth preservation idea there that gold is a good thing to be in and therefore gold miners are perhaps a good, to be thing, good thing to be in if the valuation's right. Um, Maybe we can be a bit boring now because valuations are lower. You had to be 
you had to be risk taking when you couldn't bring yourself to buy Newmont on a PE of four to not yielding anything basically. But now it's not. You know, you're talking of PEs of eight, nine, ten, eleven for these companies. So you can be boring and you can get some good exposure to gold and you probably won't lose all your money. So I'm I'm very keen on, on boring the boring is fun idea. Okay, John, you've got five minutes to get through the last 12. Here we go. Well, as a summary of where we've been so far, we can forget the arbitrary valuation measures invented by analysts and stock promoters about gold in the ground. Um, the fact that they're next to a gold mine that's produced so many million ounces. They bought a gold mine that went bust, but they still think there's millions of ounces in there. You can forget all that and look at these, look at these senior businesses as genuine companies and value them on, on a genuine basis. So that, that's point 12. Forget, if someone stands up and starts talking about ounces in the ground or you so much per inferred or whatever, in my opinion, you're in a very, very risky space. Um, and so forget about that and think of them as ordinary companies. Okay. And that, that leads on to, to the next point is that, that with gold, there are a few interesting things to say about gold. And these are my, my next five points. Um, some, some of the companies out there, we just mentioned Silvercorp. Uh, Silvercorp produces lead and zinc negative. Basically, they produce lead and zinc and sell it. That covers all their costs. So that means all the silver they produce is free. There's the Silver Wheaton, which is a royalty company. If you're worried about margin, you can buy into these companies that have a zero cash cost because of the byproducts or that you have uh, that, that are just royalty companies that will survive year in, year out because they just take royalty streams. Uh, so I think that's an interesting thing to look at if you are if you are turned on by boring is fun. Uh, so that was point 13. Yeah, and uh, 14, sector special, strength in weakness. Yes, well, we are in a distressed time now. And of course, a lot of juniors may be going under, but that means that the really good companies can cherry pick. And I truly hope the CEOs of Newmont and Barrick or, or Goldcorp are, are, are just you know, licking their lips at the prospects uh, of, of buying into a distressed market. Um, it shouldn't worry you if the market is distressed in the long term, if you're a long term investor, because okay, you've, you've taken a hit on the share price, but your companies, your growth at a reasonable price companies are now being able to go into the, the market space, maybe take over other companies at a discount at distressed prices, and that will benefit you as a shareholder in the future. If you're in a junior and you're selling at a distressed price, you're unhappy. But if you're on the senior side and you're on the side that's buying in at a distressed price, I think you should be ha happy if you can actually be a long-term investor. Also, you can hire talent at cheaper prices as well. You can, yes, absolutely. Uh, 15, nothing replaces gold as a wealth preservation tool. Yes, I think that the, the next two points are sort of related is I think we need to think about gold, something that perhaps you want to pass on to your children. You want to keep it in a physical form. It's in a vault somewhere, somewhere safe. You're waiting for um, maybe not Armageddon, but maybe hyperinflation or maybe and if I was in Greece now and I held physical gold, I'd be absolutely happy. I wouldn't be worried about capital flight. I wouldn't be worried about exchange controls. So gold is one sort of asset class. Gold miners are another sort of asset class. And I don't think you should confuse the two. And when you're thinking about a gold miner, think of them as a company with all the risks that are commensurate with investing in a company. But of course, they're in the gold space and you're probably a bit of a gold bug. And there's some special features like this royalty idea or the idea about capex and long life mines that you can bring to the table when you're thinking about them. But gold and gold companies are separate things. Very good. Uh, 17, when to sell? Uh, yeah, sorry. So point 16. Oh, the sorry. But... Yeah, the juniors, the seniors and the juniors, they're completely different too. Senior gold miners have balance sheets and cash and cash flow and their businesses. Juniors are jam tomorrow enterprises where you can make a lot of money and also lose a lot of money. Uh, and you can't replace a senior by diversifying into a basket of juniors. You can't say, well, this senior, I like the idea of geographic diversification and polymetallic and all this sort of stuff. So I'll buy a basket of juniors because in aggregate, you're not going to replace the negotiating power, the strength of diversity and the balance sheet strength of the senior miner. So I think gold, senior gold mining companies and junior gold mining companies occupy three very different uh, wealth preservation investment and speculative spaces 
Absolutely. And, and, and just looking at the kind of the, the mining cycle, if you like, or the mining investment boom bust cycle, it tends to be led by the seniors and probably at a time like now when they're showing good value. And it's the explorers that go to the moon right at the end of the cycle. So when your yeah. explorers start doubling and tripling, run. Absolutely. Uh, and I, I think that's, that's... I don't know how many times I have to learn that lesson, <laughs> but anyway. Yeah, I don't, how many, we all say that and we never do it. <laughs> okay, and 17. That, that, that comes on to point yeah. to 17, when to sell. You do absolutely run with a junior. I, I, and so many times in, investment professionals and people I respect tell me, you double, you sell half, you may ride the rest. And how many times does a stock double and we haven't sold half because we think the story is so good? With a, with a senior, I think it's different. Uh, you know, there's this saying, you never sell shell, the oil miner. I can't think of anything that rhymes with Newmont or Barrick, but uh, if you do believe that these are genuine enterprises with genuine cash flow and sustainable revenues, I don't think you should be really worried about the ins and outs, especially when they're on the valuations they are now. I think these are companies to hold for the very long term and companies that will benefit from crises where they'll be able to pick up distressed assets. Uh, if you don't think they're sustainable businesses, then don't buy them. Uh, you know, is my, my sort of opinion. Buy, buy a, a junior instead and sell on a pop. Get some excitement that way. I've held Shell for years. It's my biggest holding. I held it throughout the financial crisis. I get a nice dividend every year, and I hope to do the same with my, my holdings in the seniors. Okay, which brings us on to our final point. Gold is money. Gold miners print money. Seniorage. Yes, well, seniorage has sort of, different meanings, but basically seniorage is the, the ben benefit that accrues because the price of printing a, co a, a, a note or, or building, making a coin, the metal content and the production cost is less than the actual value uh, of that note or coin when put into the, the market as a, as, a, as, a, as a bit of money. And the benefit of seniorage normally goes to the, the mint of the company, the central bank or the government, or some people argue it goes to, um, goes to the banks that extend credit. And gold is a financial asset. Even Helicopter Ben thinks gold is a financial asset. And I think Ron Paul was a bit unhappy with him because he refused to say it was money, I think. But, I mean, forget to get Ben Bernanke to say it's some sort of financial asset. I think that's fantastic. Gold occupies a very small space. It's a global thing. You can take gold anywhere in the world and sell it. No one will ever dispute the value of a bit of gold. It's quite easy to authenticate. Generally, there's no import-export restrictions on gold. It's a bit like a bearer bond. It doesn't degrade over time. Just imagine if Apple suddenly said, well, they've produced too many iPads by mistake and they're going to stockpile them for a year. How much would those iPads be worth in the year? One of the most desirable products out there now in a year, I guess it could lose a third of its value quite easily. Gold is, is a nominally appreciating asset that will, that will carry, carry your wealth over the very long period of time. I've, I've just written the line in an article, gold, unlike uh, bubbles and government bonds, lasts forever. Ab absolutely, and it's very liquid and there's no problem monetizing it um, and capital flight or whatever. Uh, you will find that people do sometimes have trouble taking gold out of the country, but I, I can assure you when, when Asians left Uganda uh, through Idi Amin, uh, they got the gold out and that gold helped them build enterprises in Britain and the number of uh, Ugandan wealthy Asians you find in Britain now, a lot of that money came from having some capital in the form of gold that they managed to get out of the country. Uh, my stepfather escaped South Africa in the 70s with 50 Krugerrand, so yeah, there you go. And, 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 that, and that's, you know, that's, that, that, that sets you up in your next business, doesn't it? It's, yeah, well, you know, it's that sort of crisis, that's when you sell your gold. Um, Absolutely. And so producing gold is something special. Okay, you can value the gold miners as, 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 as ordinary companies. But I think there is something a bit special about producing gold. And at the, again, at the, mar at the moment, no one's valuing that. So I think it's an interesting time for the seniors. And even though they're boring companies, I think there's enough out there to differentiate between them that you can, ha you can have exciting thoughts about boring companies. Very good. John, uh, it's always a pleasure talking to you. It's nice to hear you uh, remain cynical but also positive. Uh, and uh, you're, a, you're a very clever man. And uh, thank you very much for coming on the show. Do come on again soon. Uh, do you want to give out a website or an email or would you prefer no, to I, remain I, I prefer hidden? To, I prefer to remain hidden. I do go to uh, things like Proactive. I think that's a great opportunity. Places like Mindsight or Proactive. There's lots of presentations around. Money Week, of course, a recent conference. You can meet people there um, that, that know about this space, and it's always good to talk to other investors. It's always good to talk to the, the people that run these companies and make your own decisions. So 
I think that's the place uh, to, to meet uh, like-minded people to help you make good decisions in this space. Very good. I, I find talking to people from mining companies for, me, me, leads me to make bad decisions. But there we go. <laughs> it's, you're <laughs> talking to the wrong people. Oh, OK, there you go. <laughs> uh, 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 Dr. John Wollstonecroft, once again, thank you very much and good, uh, speak to you soon. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye. Subscribe to the Gold Money newsletter at www.goldmoney.com to receive email updates on new articles, videos, and iTunes podcasts from our Gold Research section. That, that we, we can buy them as on a reasonable valuation, as reasonable businesses. And I think it's fair to say that most people are thinking with the gold mining sector today is, should, should I get in now or is it going to go any lower? And that's a much better position to be buying in than should I sell now or is it a mugs game and is it going to go higher? It's, it, it's good to be in a distressed market and to be a buyer in a distressed market. And I, I think that's a good position to be in. Um, okay. So, so, so we're lucky people. We should be grateful. Okay, well, well, that brings us on to um, point number two, which you call optionality. Um, but I, I suppose I want to ask you, and this will lead you into to point number two, is, is I mean, the, the gold mining companies aren't necessarily the cheapest that they've ever been. I think they were cheaper maybe in 2000. But um, on a relative basis, I think that's your point, that you can value them as proper companies. Yes. I, in, in the past, analysts, and I believe this is true in 2000, have had to think of all sorts of amazing wheezes to value gold mining companies because historically the price earning ratios were, were particularly high in their 30s and 40s. Silver companies, I remember a silver CEO telling me years ago that they had PEs in the 50s and therefore there was massive upside for their company. Um, <laughs> now, 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 a cynic would, would sort of say, an analyst basically has to think of something with which to compare companies. And just as in the dot-com boom, where there weren't any earnings to speak of, and so analysts had to talk about clicks and about um, number of subscribers or whatever, and we've seen a little little bit of this uh, again with Facebook recently, they came up with, with, with what I think is remarkable, I won't say a con, but it's a bit of a wheeze to say, uh, well, these miners aren't producing any money, but they've got lots of gold in the ground. And let's, um, let's look at gold futures going forwards, gold options. You know, people can trade the futures market and buy options to buy gold at higher... The information contained in this podcast is an expression of opinion and does not constitute investment advice. This is the Gold Money Foundation podcast with Dominic Frisby. Keeping you up to date with expert opinion on precious metals and the markets. Hello and welcome to the Gold Money Foundation podcast hosted in association with Frisbee's Bulls and Bears. I'm Dominic Frisbee and in today's programme I'm talking to Dr John Wustencroft, aka the junior mining cynic. You may remember a few months ago I had him on the show and uh, John did a very interesting presentation how on how a junior mining company can go from a PE of 1 to a PE of 100 in 18 easy steps. And uh, But today John's uh, coming back on the show with a rather more positive message about gold mining companies. Though in this case, we're going to be talking about the senior gold mining company, uh, companies. And John has 18 thoughts on the seniors. So, John, uh, welcome to the show. Let's crack on with thought number one, which is that we're lucky. Yes, Dominic, I think we're incredibly lucky because uh, for the first time in our investing lives, unless you were investing as a schoolboy, and that wouldn't surprise me, the, uh, <laughs> the, the, the seniors, the, the, by, by a senior we mean the big producers with a couple of mines, maybe producing a couple of hundred ounces a year plus, a lot of them you know, around a million, some more than that, not the sort of mom and pop operations with a single mine somewhere that's basically just a one-off, or, or I, I classify all these as the junior uh, space, all the non-producers where some guy's got some option over some land and doing some drilling or they've got a resource. The real genuine senior gold mining businesses, they're on good valuations and we can get exposure to the gold price and in many cases get a dividend as well just by buying these what are to some people relatively boring companies. 
So I think we're lucky because we haven't been able to do this. Uh, well, I haven't been able to do this probably since I was about 11, and I didn't know anything about investing when I was 11. Uh, and possibly you too, Dominic. So I think we're blessed. I'm not sure I know anything about it now, but there we go. <laughs> well, I didn't want to say. Um, I'm, I'm, I think we're blessed. We'd be more blessed, of course, if, if we hadn't held so many, so many juniors in the past whose, whose price has been decimated in the past year or so. But if you've been in this market a while, you've, you've had some ups, you've had some downs. Uh, most of us who've been in a while are certainly well up. And uh, my, my sort of thought today is maybe we should be thinking about these genuine senior gold mining businesses because we're in the very, very fortunate position um, 